Wow! This habitat's amazing! Wait a minute! Is that... That's not a bird! Oh, hello there! Welcome everyone to another wonderful Aquarium Online Academy! My name is Jen, and have you guessed which habitat we're going to be talking about today? If you guess wetlands, absolutely! So I am so thrilled to have you all join us today in learning about this wonderful habitat that we have here. Now, of course, I'm not alone in the studio. We have Talia that is showcasing all of these wonderful, lovely uh, habitats for us today. And then we also have Ali taking in any questions or comments that you might have. So with that, I'm going to tell you bring up the number. Perfect. Our um, our text line is down below, 562-286-1838. And if you happen to have additional questions after our program today, feel free to go on ahead and email, email us down below at live at lbaop.org. But today we are talking about wetlands. Now, is this what you think about when you picture wetlands? Hmm. You know, it's calm, it's beautiful, Ah, yes. For me, I think of this as a wetland. And how many of you have actually heard about wetlands before? Maybe this topic is completely new. And if so, that's exciting because I am so happy to be sharing this new habitat with you today. Now, can you guess some of its features by taking a look at it? Hmm. If you notice water, that's definitely half of it. If you notice land, like right behind me, that's the other half. Right here, we have a wetland. So scientists weren't super creative with this name, and that is A-OK -okay because it is exactly what it says, right? It's wetland. Now, what's really interesting about this feature here, or this habitat here, is that, you know, the wetness changes from time to time. The wetness will change in the water. The amount of water will change over time. And then also the land that's sitting on top of that water isn't always completely dry. So it can be kind of squishy <coughs> as you go on ahead and walk on through our wetland ecosystem here. So there's actually lots of mud. What else do you notice here? Hmm. Well, don't let your eyes fool you. Those aren't broccolis in the back, but lots of trees. So we have tree canopy that's in the back there. And then we also have lots of grasses too, right? So this is actually a really dynamic habitat. And what's really exciting about wetlands overall is the amount of stuff that lives in there. I'm talking biodiversity. So we're talking about the amount of creatures and organisms living in there and the different types. As a matter of fact, wetlands are so incredibly special that it rivals the rainforest and coral reefs for the amount of excitement that's in here. But right now it doesn't look too exciting, right? And that's because it is a almost like a little bit of a sleepy town. But believe it or not, though this is one example of a wetland, I bet Talia can showcase another one. Ta-da! Very nice. Now this one is also a little bit sleepy, but that's okay, because we have other wetland pictures too that maybe showcase a little bit more of some of the animals that might live there as well, right? But what is really great about this picture too is the fact that all of these pictures kind of showcase a similar thing, right? We have wetland, right? Now here, is there as much water as what you saw in the other two pictures? Not so much, right? So here it's a little bit drier. Now, if you're wondering, where do you find these wetlands, right? Because they are exciting places. Well, a lot of times you'll find them right where the ocean and the land meet. So when those two habitats meet together, that's where you get wetlands. Now, specifically, it's not just any old land. It is basically at the mouths of rivers or near rivers. And so we get this really cool exchange of fresh water and salt water. And depending upon where the animals and everyone is in that habitat, you may get more fresh water, you may get more saltier water, or maybe you get an equal mix of the two types of waters, which is called brackish water, where it's half salty and half fresh water there. Now what's really cool about these habitats that we see here is that it's really dynamic, right? We can see some of them are really vast right here. We can see lots, a huge river, 
and where these rivers meet our oceans. And so some wetlands, right, there's a lot more wet than there actually is land that we have right here. So what kind of, with this being an exciting habitat, we saw a few birds, so hopefully that gives you some clues. But a lot of magic happens either underneath the water or inside of these grasses right here. So what do you think? How do you think having a lot of water and having a lot of grasses and trees helps us out or even helps out the animals that may live in here? And yes, you're right, we have yet to talk about those animals. But can you maybe take a guess to what kind of animals would live in here? In grasses, in the water, and also how do you think this might benefit? Hmm. Now we did get a wonderful question, does the water ever overflow? And yeah, it absolutely can. So these wetlands are dynamic regions, meaning that these are areas where, like we said, the rivers meet the ocean, right? So there's a lot of things that are going on there. Now, if it's during a super rainy time here in California, it doesn't get super rainy, but there are wetlands in other parts of the world. And during, you know, when it rains a lot, the rivers start to really kind of, you know, get a lot more water in them. And so we're seeing a lot of extra fresh water, what we like to call fresh water inputs, that gets put out into the ocean right there or in these wetlands. So they may be filled with extra fresh water during those super rainy times. Other times, tides actually have an effect on these habitats here. Tides meaning where the moon and gravity are able to push and pull the seawater. And these are areas, especially in California, where we have two tide changes a day. So during these tide changes, we have high tides and low tides. And so high tides is where we have a lot of that salt water being pushed into the land, right? So if you're on a beach, you might get a chance to see a lot of soaked up sand, right? Full of seawater. And so that's where you can see where that high tide is. And then if you see a lot of that water receded or pulled back and it, you know, showcases a lot more of rocky areas like tide pools, then that's going to be that low tide. So we have these two tides a day in California. So every six hours we have more salt water that's coming in and then that salt water is going back. And then again, that salt water is coming in and it's going back. So it's a really kind of dynamic environment just by looking at the water. There's a lot of changes that are happening. So that's a good question. Now, sometimes if it's really super stormy out too, right? Whether the storm be on land or out in the ocean, what ends up happening is that these wetlands right here are able to basically take all of the power of the storms and soak it into the plants and the mud so that way any kind of homes or anything that may be living right next to these wetlands are safe. Yep. So ways so these wetlands protect a lot against storms and it keeps us safe and happy and healthy too. Now Jenny is asking, is a wetland mostly green, mostly water or greens? And Jenny, that is a good question. Also a great name, being a Jen myself, right? But it can be both. Sometimes it's more of one than the other, and it really depends on the wetlands. So Talia has been great at showcasing us here all the different types of wetlands, and some of them are more green than blue, but other times there's just more wet than land. It all depends, and it may change during the seasons, right? Now, not only is our wetland itself changing over time, there are also lots of other habitats that are nearby too. So here we're seeing lots of kind of like trees, and believe it or not, in a wetland ecosystem overall, there's not just these grasses, but like you saw in the back, there were also some trees, right? So wetlands, even though it's mainly water, mud, grasses, there are areas that are also very special that may be kind of like off the coast of California, which would be coastal sage scrub, and that are different kinds of plant communities that live around these wetlands that are a little bit more drier. So what we like to say is that there are lots of different kind of patterns and zones that are found within our wetland habitat here. So here we're seeing lots of water, we're seeing a little bit of um, mud, which may be tricky to see in this one, right? But uh, we also have lots of trees, and then we could also have lots of, um, lots of bushes too. So, ah, thank you. So here are lots of different kinds of habitats, right? We're seeing mud, we're seeing kind of greeny bushes and plants, and then we're seeing a drier habitat right over here. 
So believe it or not, these wetlands are not only mud and, well, water and grass and trees, but it has different kinds of smaller habitats that are found within here too, which is kind of cool. Now we did get a question of, is it like a swamp? And yes, absolutely. So swamps are just another kind of, well, wetlands. Now they can also be called estuaries if you're familiar with that one, or another sort of example is kind of like a bog, right? Um, so all of these are just different kinds of estuaries and these estuaries and these wetlands and these swamps just look a little bit different all around the world, which is really cool. Now, Isla is asking, do dangerous animals live there? Mm, that is a good question. Well, there are lots of different animals that can live in there. Um, anywhere from, you know, like ospreys, which are kind of like hawk animals, to some snakes that might live in there too, um, to some lizards and reptiles and opossums. So there's a whole variety of animals. And dangerous maybe just kind of depends on, you know, what predator you might be looking at and maybe afraid of, right? But these, anim these uh, habitats are really great for many animals um, that live, that can hide really well within those grasses. So maybe rabbits or squirrels, sometimes even gophers can live in there too. And occasional coyote may come by to be able to eat some of those other tastier mammals that are found in the grasses right there. But one animal that does make its way here seasonally and sometimes lives here all year round, depending upon the bird, are, well, birds. Yep. So here we have some birds, and what do you notice them doing? Hmm. Well, I notice that they're walking in this mud. I notice that as they walk, they look like that they're really kind of picking up their feet as they go, which I think is always really interesting. I also notice that some of them are in the grass pecking around but equally also in the mud. Do you notice that too? So why do you think they are walking around like that and pecking at the mud and the grass? Hmm. Well, if you're thinking food, yeah. And if we get a chance to look, right, we can see some really cool features on these birds. Ah, thank you, right? So here we can see them closer up. I'm gonna step out of the screen so you can see them a little bit better. And there we have some, these are ibises and we can see them using their really long legs to be able to move through the water. Now this water happens to be a little bit deeper than the mud that we saw earlier, but wow, isn't that handy though to be able to have those really long legs to be able to move through that water. Hmm. As a matter of fact, here's another animal that also actually resides at the aquarium, but is also found in these local wetland habitats, right? Um, so here is what we have as a, as a black neck stilt that we have right here. And look at these super long legs that it has and that long beak. Hmm. So what do you think it might use them for? Hmm. Well, we definitely saw the long legs being able to wade through the water, right? Those long beaks though, was there anything that you noticed in that video with our ibis? Ah, like oh, looks like that they're running on water. It does, doesn't it? Because that mud's pretty shiny. So it definitely does look like that, right? And so these animals do have those long legs, which almost allow them to basically run on water. So that's a great observation. Thank you for sharing, right? But these long beaks are also great at going into the mud to get any kind of tasty snack that they so choose whether that be maybe a little clam that's in the mud, or maybe that be like a worm, um, anything that may be kind of hard and, or soft and squishy would be a great food for these animals with these really long beaks. And what a cool feature of these animals, right? A cool adaptation for them to be able to utilize these long legs and those long beaks to really kind of maximize their potential of where they hang out in the wetlands, right? So it's pretty interesting in that regards. Now we did get a question of what kind of animals do live in wetlands. So right now we're talking about birds that live in wetlands because believe it or not, we have some birds that hang out in wetlands all year round and other birds that actually use wetlands as a, well, as a break area or a pit stop on their travels, right? Because many birds, they go on ahead and they can migrate 
And so this wetland habitat is a great resource for them. It's where they can get food, right? It's where they can sleep in a safe area with all of these tall shrubs and grasses. It's a place maybe that they want to raise their young. So it's a great place for them to hang out because there's so much food, right? Because remember, these places have similar numbers to what you would find out in a rainforest or a coral reef. It's just a little bit more, well, understated, right? You have to really look with your eyes to really be able to see what's kind of going on here. And then the grasses, or when there's migratory birds that are coming on by, like these egrets, or maybe what's happening down below. So that's a great question. Now we did have a question about the ibis. Are there flamingos? Now flamingos are really interesting because they don't necessarily live in wetlands, but flamingos will look for um, habitats that are actually kind of salty. So that is a really good question because like we mentioned, right, our wetlands can be salty, can be a little freshwater, or maybe a mix of both. And so flamingos do like saltier water, um, but they kind of like a little bit harsher lakes. Um, so not necessarily wetlands, but a lot of times lakes where it's super salty and these special shrimp live in there. And as they eat those delicious shrimp, that's what gives them their color. Pretty cool, huh? And so flamingos a little bit different, but they have those similar adaptations, don't they? Especially to our ibis. So they have the long legs and kind of the downturned beak, right? Flamingo beaks are a little bit shorter, but they serve that same purpose of really being able to wade through the water and then duck down to real to get all of those shrimp and tasty things in the water. So that's a great question. So thank you for asking. Now we did get an observation of these legs are like twigs and you got it, right? So they have nice long legs, skinny legs that help them to be able to maneuver. Now, um, I apologize if I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, Melody is asking, how do the birds walk on water? Well, the secret is those long twig-like legs. See there? Yeah, so they have really long twig legs. Now here's the interesting part, is that if we think about our knees and the way that our knees bend, well, if you walk around, you can see your knees, right? Our knees bend forwards. Well, what about these animals? They bend backwards, right? So they're able to really kind of move through the water. And actually for some of them, they're able to kind of shimmy their legs through the water to be able to get some food. Now, a good example of that is an egret, um, a snowy egret, as a matter of fact. So here we have an example of such a bird. So with these birds that we have here, we did quite a question of what food is there. Now, the food is kind of also understated and hidden, right? We're seeing that these wetlands, there's more to meet the eye than what we actually see. So in this case, we have our snowy egret. And are there any features that really stand out to you? Hmm. Oh, I know for me, those beautiful white feathers are just absolutely amazing, right? So they are ones that really kind of catch my eye. But so do these black long legs. And do you see it? The yellow feet that we have right here, right? So this egret is really great at putting its feet underneath the mud and it shakes the feet around and then it'll walk a little bit and then it'll shake its feet some more and then it'll walk a little bit and wiggle its little toes shake its feet underneath the mud some more why do you think it might do that do you think it just likes to dance well even though it does look like it could probably be a good dancing bird but it does that mainly to be able to get food yep the food that it likes to eat is in the mud so this area, actually, inside of the mud, is also very rich and dynamic. There's actually a lot going on underneath there. Any thoughts to what kind of animals might live underneath the mud? Hmm, let's see if we go back to that egret picture. We're not going to go directly to the water just yet, though it's going to be very exciting when we do, right? But just looking underneath the mud right here, if you think about on land, what kind of stuff lives in dirt? If you're thinking... Well, maybe some snails or worms. Kind of the same thing here, actually. We'll have those same sort of muddy animals living in that same space. And so there's so many of them because, well, if we have a lot of grasses here, 
And we have a lot of actual animals that live in here, like birds. Hmm, believe it or not, there's a lot of nutrients, a lot of vitamins that are coming in from the mud, from the surrounding areas, maybe from the rivers it's being brought in, maybe it's from the other animals that are living here, like the mice or the rats or the opossums or all of the different bird types or maybe the coyotes or maybe even the rabbits or the snakes, right? All of them have to use the bathroom and there really aren't little miniature toilets for them to use. So instead, when they go on this water, right, or on the mud itself, all of the snails, all of the worms, they go on ahead and transform all of that poop, right, into beautiful, rich soil for all of the plants that we were able to see growing on there, right? Because yes, we do have mud right here, but if we go back to a picture of a wetland, I don't know about you, but I saw mainly lots of plants, right? There's plants everywhere. I see trees back there. I see, you know, grasses over here. I see little shrubs over there, right? And so there's tons of plants. And these plants need nutrients, right? Need those vitamins to be able to grow. So it's all because of all those animals that live inside the mud that really help all of these plants to be able to grow right here. So that's pretty exciting. Now, we did get a question of how many kinds of wetland animals are there? Now, there are many different kinds. I just labeled off a few, so hopefully you're able to hear a little bit about that answer. But you know what? Let's go ahead and dive underneath the water because that's one area that we have yet to cover that has even some more animals. So we did get some questions about any sharks, frogs, and fish. And yes, frogs are another animal that can live in wetlands. I only named a small handful. If I named out all of them, well, our class time would be over. So it's really incredible though, and I really appreciate how many of you are thinking about, well, these, this habitat, right? All the different features of it, right? All the different characteristics, and then what other kind of animals could live there, right? Because we're only touching on a few since we only have half an hour, but trust me, I too could talk wetlands all day long. But let's go ahead and let's take a peek underneath the water. What do you notice here? What kind of animals do you see? Hmm. Now, no sharks in this particular area that we're noticing right now, but believe it or not, there are sharks that do live in wetlands and will actually have some of their babies in more wetlandy areas. And then as they get older, they'll move out into the ocean. So it definitely is kind of a safe space for many of these animals. Now here, I'm also seeing more green, aren't you? Yes. So the plant theme still continues underneath the water. Here we have eel grasses of all different varieties. And how do you think these fish and these other animals that live in there, mainly fish that we're seeing right now, how do you think they might use the eel grass? Hmm. Well, if you're curious to know what kind of fish they are, as we did get a text on in, a lot of these are going to be shiner surf perch. Um, those are going to be the more shiny ones that we see. And then um, here we have some, oh my goodness, I'm currently blanking on it. Uh, I think they're white croaker that we have here. And then we also have a top smelt that's roaming around. It's a very skinny fish. Aha, there it goes. That is the top smelt right there. And then we also have some other surf perch that are in here. And then, do you see the mystery fish? It's hiding underneath the sand. Ha, here's one. Do you see it? It's a flatfish. Yep. So really cool other adaptations, right, of these animals. They're either going to be really bright and shiny and kind of bounce the light off to make them really hard to see, or they're going to hide underneath like our flatfish friend here. Now here we have our flatfish friend and it's exposed, right? We can see it, it's not underneath the sand, but it's still really hard to see. Isn't that cool, right? So other animals are going to live in the sand and eat some of the critters that are found even more in that mud, right? So it's a really cool dynamic area where there's so much to see. You just really need to, you know, go in and see if you can find what critters are living in there. Now. We did get a variety of questions, so I want to make sure that I'm able to address them. Um, Damaris is asking, can you swim in the wetlands? You know what? It kind of depends. A lot of time the water is actually really shallow, but 
you know what? I'm only speaking from experience of here off the California coast. There are so many different wetlands, and there are wetlands all over the world. One of the largest wetlands is actually called the Pantanal. And with that, there's like an entire river system, and it's incredible. So I would imagine in some estuaries or swamps or bogs or wetlands, you can swim. But many of the ones off of California, because we're in a more dry climate, it may be kind of tricky to do that. But that is a good question. Also, many wetlands are protected. Did you know in California, 90, 90, 0, 90 percent of our wetlands are gone? Yep, sad but true. So we only have 10 percent of our wetlands here in California. Um, many people thought wetlands were kind of boring and gross to look at because, to be honest, sometimes they smell like rotten eggs. But you know what that's the smell of? Ah, productivity, all that life that is in there. And that's what's kind of causing a lot of that smell. But some folks are like, ah, this habitat's boring. Let's build houses that look over the ocean or, you know, water. And so a lot of the, the areas within California, our wetlands are gone. So at least we can appreciate that 10% um, for now. And then we can also learn about other wetlands and wetland habitats all around the world because they each have different sets of animals and are equally interesting, in my opinion. All right, Eliza is asking, how deep can wetlands be? Eliza, hopefully we had a chance to answer that question as it can vary depending upon the type of wetlands. Now, Piper's asking, are there fish, saltwater or freshwater fish? That's a good question, right? Because we talked about wetlands kind of being maybe in areas a little bit more fresh, uh, maybe a little bit more salty, or maybe somewhere in between. Now, these animals that we're showcasing here that are actually found here at the Aquarium of the Pacific are happen to be salty fish. Um, not because they're like angry fish, but because they are more um, accustomed. They are used to living in more of a saltwater environment. So many of the animals, like our top smelt here, right, we'll find them in kind of these habitats that are more protected, but then they can go more out into the ocean to be able to survive. So um, definitely some more saltwater-like fish that are here. But believe it or not, there are also stingrays that can live in here too. So not only just the bony fish that we see here, but also a cartilaginous fish, a fish that has kind of the same material that our noses and our ears are made out of too. And so stingrays are another great animal that can live in this habitat as well. Now we did get another question. Is it foggy there? I'm sorry, that's a good question. You know what? It, I bet it would depend. Now, for wetlands, a lot of times when the temperatures are really different between the water and kind of the air, sometimes you can get this beautiful fog that appears. And usually that happens either in the morning or maybe super late at night, usually in the morning time though. Um, and so in that case, that may happen. Now these just all happen to be clear images, so not foggy there, um, but sometimes wetlands can be foggy. And to be honest, I think they're some of the most beautiful when they are foggy or even when it's stormy. I just love seeing such, a, such an exciting environment with so much movement that's happening. It's just beautiful. Thank you for asking. Now we did get a question of, do they ever get stuck in the mud? Well. All of our animals have special features on them that help them to survive, right? So some of them, like the flatfish, can go into their more sandy bottoms. So they might be further out here where it's a little bit more sandy and this would be a little bit more muddy. So they're able to flip themselves underneath the sand and bury themselves. Now the birds, they have those special legs, right? And if you notice, those legs are really tiny. And so there's not a lot of weight that's on those legs. So they're able to really kind of be gentle as they walk around on the mud or any other surface, right? So that's how they're not able to get stuck. Now we as humans, if we're going out investigating these, these wetlands, mind you, there is potential that we could get stuck. So you have to be very careful as you're in your maybe like boots, right? <laughs> going through the mud that you may not get stuck and deal with the suction that's caused by the mud, right? So definitely something that we might have to watch out for if you're in a very muddy wetland. Now Kimberly is asking, are there germs in the water? Well, believe it or not, Kimberly, there are germs pretty much everywhere um, on this planet. And germs are actually, surprisingly, a lot of times helpful 
for a lot of the animals that live in here. These germs um, are actually really good at also helping break down a lot of that poop um, and able to make that into beautiful vitamins for our plants to be able to use. So germs, surprisingly helpful. Thank you for bringing that up, Kimberly. And lastly, Alexander, how many wetlands are there in the world? Oh my goodness, that is a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if my friend Allie can go on ahead and look that up for me. Um, but as we do so, I just wanted to thank everyone today for joining us and for participating. It's been so fun getting a chance to talk about wetlands with you all. Oh, looks like there's about 2,000 wetlands in the world. And what's really amazing is there's no two that are the same, right? There are so many different creatures with special features and adaptations that it would be kind of cool to be able to visit as many as you can to see what things and what plants and what animals may be similar in some and what may be different in others, right? Are there ones that you can, you know, swim in? Are there ones that maybe you could take a boat through and experience, right? Or are there ones where you can go through the mud and check out yourself, right friends? So thank you so very much for joining us. Now teachers, if you happen to be watching this with your class, we'd really appreciate your help in sending in the number of students that you have watching today. Uh, this helps us to be able to prioritize our, our programs and help us to really get a better idea um, of the viewership that's out there. So please go on ahead and text in your numbers of students that you happen to have available and uh, Alia will be able to, to get those numbers down for us. You can always just go on ahead and text them in down below, 562-286-1838. Well, thank you again, everyone. I had such a blast showcasing or talking a little bit and sharing about these beautiful wetland habitats. There's definitely more that meets the eye, huh? So I'm excited for you to be able to check out a wetland near your home sometime in the future. All right, friends, take care.